gonna walk past this yard because I don't want to get barked at. I don't want to get barked at. Don't bark at me. See, I knew you were gonna do that. I said don't bark at me. Well, we're approaching the end of the course. It may not feel like it, but here we are. We've got about four weeks to go. At this point, I think we've got enough under our belts to start really thinking hard about adaptation. We've discussed some stuff on film techniques and film theory, and we've even begun to crack open what adaptation is or does. More than that, though, through the lectures and the films we've seen, you've watched a range of adapted story types, from film stage productions to animated features to made-for-TV movies to teen romantic comedies to cinematic masterpieces to slouching arthouse knockoffs. I'd like to unpack some broader theories of adaptation today, and maybe give us some new terms to make use of. But I think first it might help us to see some of the adaptations of this text firsthand. I also want to talk about a few of the most important or significant moments in the history of this play's adaptation. We started this class thinking about whether or not Shakespeare is a great author. My take is that Shakespeare more becomes our model for what great authors produce. But that reputation comes not just from the works themselves, but from the centuries of adaptations that follow. King Lear is a prime example. Today, scholars think of King Lear as probably the most refined tragedy in Shakespeare's body of work, better even than Hamlet or Romeo and Juliet. But their reputation is complicated. Here's an interesting historical factoid. Shakespeare's version of King Lear wasn't really performed regularly until the middle of the 19th century. We know it was performed for King James in about 1606. It was likely performed in the Globe as an occasional part of the repertoire of Shakespeare's theater company. But then, only about 25 years later, there's a massive cultural shift in England, a revolution, and it has a huge impact on how theater is performed. So what was this change, and what's it got to do with King Lear? I've mentioned before the religious tensions in England during Shakespeare's time. On the one hand, anti-Catholic sentiment comes to a boiling point with the gunpowder plot in 1605, when Guy Fox and his popish buddies try to blow up the king in Parliament. This doesn't put an end to the Jesuits in England, but it does drive them way underground for a while. On the other hand, the other extremist religious group, the Puritans, were still a problem. It's not exactly fair to pin all the civil unrest in the period on religion, but I think it's easy to see that in a society in which religious participation is compulsory, that civil unrest will take on religious language. And when religious language itself is enshrined in the state church, the entanglement between authority and lived religious devotion of the people is bound to cause some tension. The tension in England turns into a full-on civil war in 1642. The king, Charles I, who is James' son, versus some members of parliament who represent a whole bunch of nonconformist or dissenting Christian traditions. It's a really interesting moment in history and totally worth looking into if you've got an interest in history of England or of the church. Google it sometime. The too long didn't read is this. The king's control over the church gives him too much power. Couple this with Charles' firmly held belief that he is, in fact, God's anointed king, you've got a recipe for theologically justified tyranny. End result is Charles is eventually tried for treason, which is interesting for a king. He's found guilty and beheaded. Now with no king and the Church of England without special state sanctioning, the Puritans take control. Oliver Cromwell becomes Lord Protector of the new English Commonwealth. Cromwell's kind of a notable curmudgeon. He's a fierce disciplinarian. Think about Volio, but now he's in charge of the whole country. Do you see now why it was so important to not let Malvolio stay mad? Now, as you know, Puritans are not huge fans of theater. In fact, they hate it. Puritans tend to think that theater is the root of all society's problems. It's like video games or heavy metal or jazz. Puritans are always doing this stuff. They try to deplatform or legislate against things they disagree with. So theater is canceled. Hooray for the Puritans, but you know, bummer for everyone else. Long story short, Cromwell dies and no one else has the kind of power to hold it all together. England as a whole kind of realizes this whole Commonwealth thing was a bad idea, so we go find executed Charles' son and make him King Charles II. Uh, incidentally, historical footnote, after Charles is made king, they go put Cromwell on trial, even though he's already dead. Uh, he doesn't put up much of a defense, I mean, you know, being dead and all, so they find him guilty and they behead him. I mean, it's kind of expensive. Well, at the restoration of the throne, we also get a restoration of theater. And who better to signal the return of the English stage than the greatest writer to have ever written in England himself, old Bill Shakespeare. 
So there's a Shakespeare Renaissance. Women actors start playing the female roles. There are uh, elaborate new costumes and new elaborate sets as well. All of Shakespeare's works get performed. It's great. Well, I mean, except King Lear, of course. See, it's tough to put on a play that ends with the death of the king and the complete dissolution of the kingdom when everything else in culture is about praising the restoration of the king. There's just no room in the social subconscious for this kind of thing. We might say more charitably that this culture has no need to purge these ideas. They've literally all just had a decade of purging during the Commonwealth. Failed kings and striving political upstarts are not things that need to be imagined. So we're riding the wave of a new Shakespeare high, but we can't have the kind of tragedy we get in King Lear. So what do we do? Well, in 1681, there's a new adaptation of King Lear written by poet laureate Nahum Tate. It's called The History of King Lear. Tate's version is remarkable. I put a link up for you. For one thing, it cuts the character of the fool out entirely. We might say there's no need to speak truth to power when truth is power. Remember, this is in the context of the restoration of the king. An even more significant change, though, Tate's adaptation is a comedy. The end of the play has Lear, Gloucester, and Kent all happily talking about retiring, and for real this time, no divvying up the kingdom stuff. Cordelia is alive, she marries Edgar. The play concludes with not just a marriage, but a new properly established order for succession. Cordelia and Edgar have a joint rule and will have properly royal offspring. We'll never not have a king again. Edgar even gets the closing line. He says, Divine Cordelia, how much thy love to empire I prefer. Thy bright example shall convince the world that truth and virtue shall at last succeed. It's laying it on pretty thick. But this play, as weird as it is, gives us one of the key things about adaptation. It actually helps us see the original better when we start to see what other appropriations of the text feel like they need to erase. Remember Linda Hutchins' claim from earlier in the term. When I watch an adaptation of a book, a film adaptation of a book that I know, um, it's like watching a palimpsest. There's sort of two things going on. And I'm not necessarily comparing them. I, I probably am, but I'm not evaluating that comparison. I'm just noticing that this is the same, this is different, or whatever. Adaptation is a kind of palimpsest where we can read the original by the very act of its erasure. We can see the old under the new. Here, the main thing that gets cut is the way Shakespeare's text problematizes the legitimacy of sovereignty. For Shakespeare, Lear is mad, outmoded, vain, his method of rule is disintegrating. For Tate, Lear is and has always been the true and rightful king. Edmund, Goneril, Regan, all these guys in this version are not ambiguously operating out of a competing moral framework. They're simply wrong for opposing the true strength of the king. Hilariously, Tate's version ends with a brief note from the author, an epilogue spoken by the actress playing Cordelia. Everyone else shuffles off the stage and she steps forward and concludes with an outright defense of the adaptation itself. And interestingly, it's one that draws directly on the greatness of capital S Shakespeare. She says, still so many master touches shine out of that vast hand that first laid this design that in great Shakespeare's right, he's bold to say, if you like nothing you have seen today, the play your judgment damns, not you the play. So if you, the audience, don't like this play, well then you don't like Shakespeare because that's where we got this story. And if you don't like Shakespeare, well, then you don't really know what good theater is and your opinion means nothing. This is fascinating because it's the same kind of move modern films will make when they insist on being adapted from the work of Shakespeare. It's a way of tapping into a cultural authority against which any dissent is immediately dismissed as irrelevant. The attitude is basically, Shakespeare's great, and if you disagree, then your opinion doesn't count. Also, my movie is basically Shakespeare, so, you know. So what we see happening in Tate's adaptation is not only a complete reaffirmation of cultural and political authority, but the application of that authority to itself. Tate doesn't just argue for the supremacy of Shakespeare. He also conflates his own text with Shakespeare. That's an old trick. Whenever someone talks about the absolute authority of some cultural artifact or political idea, they're usually just trying to grant themselves that authority. Ironically though, or, or maybe it's poetic justice, Tate can really only do that by losing himself and his own motivations in the larger blob of that authoritative complex of Shakespeare's greatness. This isn't Tate's play, after all, according to the epilogue. It's Shakespeare. Tate cuts out his own agency to hide it in accepted authority. Dude gives up his soul to gain the world.
and it's so effective that Tate's version is performed almost exclusively until the 1830s. It's not until the 1840s that Shakespeare's full King Lear is restored to the stage. Tate gets excised like a parasite, and now it's little more than a historical curiosity. Six Semper Terranus. That interpretation may not be entirely fair to Tate. The text deserves careful analysis in its own right. One of Tate's legacies is that his play starts a long, long tradition of adaptations of King Lear. Another notable one we had a short look at last week, the 1910 silent film. This is the first King Lear on film. There's another stab at it later on in 1916 by an American company. This is only one example of a whole crop of early silent films based on literary classics. There's a great version of Frankenstein and a really famous Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but also almost all of Shakespeare's works are made into silent films. They're all very short and very rough. The longest is only about 15 minutes. Now, adapting some of those gothic horror classics makes sense. The film medium can do some really fancy new things with special effects, and the spectacle of these films really tried to highlight how cinema could add a new dimension to storytelling. But Shakespeare? I mean, for centuries, Shakespeare's been known for his language, but a silent film doesn't have any dialogue. Not only that, but the play King Lear itself crucially hinges on the roles of speech and silence to convey truth. Cordelia, right? Cordelia has this debate with herself on how to address the situation of the love test her father sets up at the beginning of the play. She can't speak because all the language has already been evacuated of meaning by the ceremony, or it's been made empty by her sister's false proclamations of love. So she opts for silence. She literally says, love and be silent. Well, heck, in a silent film, if everybody's silent, that doesn't really get us anywhere, Cordelia. Now, there certainly is something similar here about tapping into that capital S Shakespeare tradition to lend some legitimacy to a work. In this case, the entire new medium of film was looking for that same legitimacy. In 1910, film was just a gimmick still. It wasn't a, a true medium for real art. It was a parlor trick. By adapting famous literary works, Shakespeare among them, filmmakers were trying to showcase the potential of this new medium as a form of art. But I think as an adaptation, this film does even more than that. It also pulls out something through its erasure, but maybe the opposite way from what Tate is doing. While Tate's comic version of King Lear gives us new access to the subversive critique of sovereignty in Shakespeare's original, the silent Lear retrieves something obscured by the written text the visual spectacle, the physicality of the performance. Look, it's one thing to read about old mad King Lear stumbling into the storm. It's something we barely get from the stage directions. It's something else entirely to see it. By removing language from the equation, we actually get to have new appreciation for this otherwise secondary element of the play. I think it might help to get another critical term in here, transmediation. This comes directly from communication studies, so I suspect many of you have encountered this term before. It's maybe a bit broader than adaptation when we go to apply it, but I think it will help us get a better look into the process or action that informs an adapted work. The term transmediation comes from a semiotician named Charles Sewer. Sewer defined it as translation of content from one sign system to another. So taking something that's rooted in the written word and transforming it into music or visual art or the like. Now, there's kind of two ways we can read that. On the one hand, it might be that we're trying to bring about the same emotional impact or feeling of the initial text in this new medium, uh, something like an analog that carries the same ideas. So if we were to adapt King Lear into a symphony, we might want to start by thinking about what the text conveys, what it results in, the effect it has on a viewer, and then make use of the tools of the symphony to carry over that same feeling as best we can. But on the other hand, we also have to acknowledge that the new medium will automatically import with it a new set of interpretive possibilities that were otherwise unavailable in the original medium. If the medium is the message, then the new medium makes a new message possible. The study of transmediation is the study of the ways those new meanings emerge. Now, this is really helpful for understanding how an adaptation gets made. Transmediation starts to give us a method by which we can understand the opportunities each medium might present to us, and therefore also give us some direction on what each medium will highlight. Tate's comic transmediation highlights the play's entanglements with sovereignty. The transmediation of the silent film highlights the physically draining effects of mental disintegration. But both give insight into the written text in a new way because they help us see the unique contributions of the written medium.
It's lyricism or the complex set of parallels it produces across characters through their language. If we were to put this into a different medium, yet again, a graphic novel, an essay, a short story, a poem, we would see another set of opportunities arise that give us different valences from which to engage the narrative, which would themselves open up new ways of reading all of the other media forms the narrative is presented in. So obviously, the book isn't always better. The book is one medium through which some unique aspects of a narrative might be expressed. But film might give us something different. Painting, something different again. Music, yet again, and so on. Or, or maybe the book is always better, but it has nothing to do with the status of a book as a book. It has everything to do with the execution of its transmediation. Adaptations fail all the time, and often it's because they simply don't account for the new opportunities presented to them by the new medium, and instead aim for a simple one-to-one -one direct translation from one medium to another. The book isn't necessarily always better, but a fish can't live in space. I wanted to talk about Kira Kurosawa's RAN too in all of this. I mean, the medium changes again. Film, but now with all the tools of modern cinematography. It's an epic film. It's also foreign made. It's translated with subtitles. It imports all sorts of new cultural information by marrying Shakespeare's play to an old Japanese myth. Kurosawa's film also does all sorts of work in blending genres. It's wild. But I, I think I've taken enough of your time. A and you could probably guess anything I'm going to say here based on the stuff I was saying earlier. But I'd really like to hear you say some stuff about Rand, maybe in the comments. The thing to keep in mind when you're watching this movie, or, or really any adaptation, is to first and foremost get what the film itself is doing in its own right. When you've seen that more clearly, you might ask what it adds to Shakespeare's play that wasn't there before. Remember, adaptations too have to do their own work. And when they do, they might end up saying more about the original than the original ever could have said on its own.